Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to give it another minute or two to allow folks to join. Uh, so feel free, grab some water. We have a wonderful program uh, scheduled for you. A lot of incredible dynamic speakers that are really going to talk about the attack on state voting rights and then tie it together about how the For the People Act can help um, correct some of these issues that are going on in the states. Um, in the meantime, if you can actually go ahead and drop your name and where you're from in the chat, that will be wonderful. And also, uh, fun thing I've seen before, if you can also put an interesting fact about your state. Um, I found some really uh, fun uh, facts uh, doing this. So I'm going to give it about another minute. If you want to go ahead and drop your name in the chat, uh, that will be wonderful. And if you look on screen, you will actually see that we're uh, doing this in collaboration with a lot of wonderful environmental groups. Um, so just wanted to give a shout out to each and every one of them. They do tremendous work and were really helpful uh, pulling together this event. Um, so just wanted to flag that for everybody. But perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to give you a quick um, run of show just to let you know what's occurring, and then we'll hop right into the program. Um, so on the next slide, um, we'll first start off with um, why we care about democracy issues. So we're honored um, to be joined by Mitch Bernard of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, then we'll go into state voting rights attacks. So we're honored also to be joined by three individuals who's been working on the ground in each of those states really working to combat some harmful anti-voter uh, bills that have been passing in state legislatures. So we'll dive into what those bills are and talk about kind of how the real impact of each of those. Following that, we'll go to Adam Liotz uh, from Demos. He will talk about the For the People Act and really kind of tie together about how that bill will be able to negate a lot of these harmful provisions that have passed in the states. We'll also dive a little bit deeper into the For the People Act. So if you don't know about it, no worries. I know it's a big bill, but it's one of the bills that can really transform our democracy. And it's one of the most critical issues that I, I believe that we're facing in the next couple of weeks or months. Following that, we'll go to a Q&A section. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the event, I definitely encourage you to drop it in the chat. Um, we'll try to answer it uh, live, but if not, we can definitely throw it in uh, during that Q&A portion. So definitely encourage you if you have questions, thoughts uh, that emerge during any of these segments, go ahead and drop that question in the chat. Following that, we'll go into a skills training. Uh, we'll be joined by the wonderful Sam Lockhart of the National Wildlife Federation and for lobby of Greenpeace USA. And they will tie together about what you can do on the ground and today to really make a difference. Um, so they have a wonderful training set up, so we'll go into that. So from there, we'll go to the next slide um, and we'll be joined by Mitch Bernard, who's the president and chief counsel of the National Resources De Defense Council. He will talk about why we care about democracy issues. So kind of tying together that we're all environmentalists, we all care about environmental issues, but why we should also really pay attention and care about democracy issues. Uh, so with that, Mitch, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Tishan, and thanks everybody for joining tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this topic really couldn't be more fundamental uh, to what so many of us care about. The For the People Act, is the most consequential people empowering legislation since the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It would expand the public's access to free and fair elections and rein in uh, corporate polluters' destructive influence uh, on our democratic process. It would also ensure that our democracy works for everyone, especially communities of color, who historically carry the heaviest burden of pollution and also the most significant barriers to voting. We're seeing right now that many state legislatures are pulling out all the stops to try to suppress the vote. And tonight we'll hear from state experts on the front lines in Arizona, Florida, and Michigan. They'll talk about their state's voter suppression efforts and how we can try to stop them. We'll also hear about how Congress can thwart most of these state-based efforts if it enacts the For the People Act. This bill is a 
is a once in a generation opportunity to fortify an inclusive democracy for and by the people. We can't, why should environmentalists care about voting rights? Isn't it a separate issue? It's not in the traditional lane of environmentalism. We have to break through that. That's a myth. We, we cannot effectively tackle the critical issues that we face, like combating the climate crisis, advancing environmental justice, protecting our, our air, our water, our drinking water, our, our land and biodiversity, wildlife, oceans, on and on, without resisting a system that caters to corporate polluters and disenfranchises too many voters. We need a thriving democracy in order to create the change that we're seeking. The For the People Act will tear down barriers that are absolutely being erected to silence black, brown, indigenous, young, and new voters. And it will ensure that everyone has a say in the decisions that have such a significant impact on our lives. The Senate must pass the For the People Act in order to protect the freedom to vote and ensure that everyone's voices are heard so that we can make real and lasting climate process uh, progress, uh, protect the environment and advance justice for all. A very smart writer wrote recently that he, he said, what is an environmental issue? Well, an environmental issue is anything that gets in the way of environmental progress. Any impediment to environmental progress, that's an environmental issue and voting rights clearly falls within that category. We have to be involved. A thriving democracy is the foundation for the change we're seeking. And um, that's why voting rights are so, so central. So the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, has promised to bring the For the People Act to uh, the Senate floor for a vote in the last week in June. We have to do everything we can to demonstrate our support for this critical legislation before that vote takes place. You'll hear more tonight um, from other speakers on why this legislation is critical and what you can do to make a difference. So I appreciate your joining. I appreciate all the efforts you're making and will make. Um, if we are committed to environmental progress, if we're committed to fighting climate change, if we're committed to environmental justice, we must engage in the battle over voting rights. So that's my message. And again, I'm very glad to be here tonight and appreciate everybody's participation in this uh, community effort. And now I'll turn it back to you, Tishan. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mitch. And I think you hit the nail on the head where the reason why we should care as environmentalists is that so many people, um, if they can't get an accurate representation in Congress, then those issues are cast aside, right? Another major issue like heat islands, like if gerrymandering does persist, then people that actually care about that can vote in people that care about such issues as heat islands or lead pipes and things like that. So I think that is one of the critical issues that we face as environmentalists. And I think that really emphasizes that how much we should care about democracy issues. Um, but with that, thank you again, Mitch. Uh, we'll be going to our next segment. Uh, so we'll be pulling on Justin uh, from the League of Conservation Voters. Um, Justin will also be bringing on uh, three other state speakers, and he'll be facilitating um, a conversation uh, about what's going on in those states. Um, so Justin, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. And I think we'll be pulling on uh, Jaleesa, uh, Alex, and then also uh, Christy. Hello, everybody. As Sean said, my name is Justin Quassa. I'm the Voting Rights Program Director at the League of Conservation Voters and really happy to be here with all of you today. So uh, as Sean said, you know, and uh, as, as previous folks have said, uh, you know, right now we are at a critical moment where we need to pass S1, but also it's really important to talk about what does that actually look like in the states and what's going on in the states around the country uh, and what effect of S1 going to be uh, to what's happening across the country. And so we have these three wonderful guests that are going to tell you about each of their individual states. So first, 
want to start with my personal colleague uh, that I'm really happy to, to introduce to you, Jessica Giles, uh, who is the Civic Engagement Director for the Democracy for All Florida, uh, which is a part of Florida Conservation Voters Education Fund. So Jalisa, take it away and tell us about what you've seen going on in the Shunsign State. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, there's so much that's going on here. Um, despite what anyone thinks about last year's election, we all know that it was one of the most historic elections that we've had. Despite COVID here in Florida, we had a huge turnout and we had record numbers of people going to the polls as well as mailing back their mail, mail by mail. They vote by mail ballots, I'm sorry. Um, but apparently it's, it's been made pretty clear that our um, legislature thought it was too successful. And so now a response of, of last year's elections, there's been a couple of bills that have been passed that really hurt our communities, specifically one called um, HB1, which is the anti-protest bill, which is a, of course a response to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it is a direct attack on our community leaders we have historically black and brown people have used protesting as a way to affect legislation and now it's being taken away from us. Um, for example, now if you go out and protest and you get arrested, you will be in jail for at least six months until you're able to get a hearing. You cannot post bail. And then of course, if convicted, you lose your right to vote. So it's just the first way that you get to our community leaders, you get to our communities that want to fight back and want to use their voice. Now you're taking away their right to vote and you're taking away their voice. Um, something else that happened was our um, anti-voter access bill, the SB90 has been passed as well, which makes it extremely hard for people to vote by mail. It puts so many restrictions on where the mail, where the drop boxes are and how often you need to sign up for vote by mail. Um, they have made it so that the locations of the drop boxes are so far apart. So for example, if you are um, a mother or just a person with responsibilities who doesn't live in Doral or in downtown Miami, for example, then you might not be able to get there in time to drop off your, your vote by mail ballots. Um, not only that, it also attacks the third party voter registration programs. It puts limitations on us to be able to register people to vote. And it's just an all around attack on our voting rights, on our, our uh, right to speech. It, it's just an attack on us wholeheartedly to change what happened last year. And I do think that if HR1 is passed, it could really help Florida. Great, thank you, Jalisa. Uh, next, we want to take it uh, to Michigan. So I uh, wanted to introduce you uh, to Christine, uh, Christy uh, McGillivray um, to talk about what's going on in, in the Wolverine state. So Christy, you mind taking it away? Sure, happily, and uh, good job on my last name, Justin. It's McGillivray, you got it pretty spot on. So thank you, um, folks, I am from Michigan and uh, we are part of a much uh, bigger coordinated attack, attack on democracy across the country here in our state. However, our state constitution has a specific provision um, that actually allows the state legislature to enact legislation without the governor's signature um, if it's initiated through a citizen referendum um, that has signatures equal to 10% of the vote in the last gubernatorial election. Um, so what that means for us here on the ground right now, we have a Republican controlled uh, state legislature and we have a Democratic governor and their plan is to take the worst of the worst of uh, anti-democracy bills that are currently being debated in the state legislature, uh, put them on a citizen uh, petition drive and get around the governor by running that petition drive. Um, and for some context of what this means for our state, in 2018, we passed Prop 3 with overwhelming support from Michiganders, both Democrats and Republicans, independents, everyone overwhelmingly supported expanding voting rights in the state. So what they are planning on doing is taking a very slim minority, um, it's about 340,000 voters, and using that slim minority to crawl back the, the expansion of voting that we saw in 2018. And that expansion made our 2020 election so successful. Um, so we're seeing the, the same playbook of bills. We've got strict voter ID laws. 
Uh, we've got laws that will prohibit um, prepaid postage going out on absentee ballots. Uh, we have laws that will make it impossible for the Secretary of State to send out absentee ballot applications to voters. And it goes as far as to even not allow the Secretary of State to put that link to the application on the state website. Um, so, you know, it's a playbook that we're seeing in other states. However, in Michigan, we're worried about this one provision that will allow the state legislature to do an end run around the governor. Um, so I, uh, I'll leave it there. I'm sure other folks are going to get into some of the details, but HR1, um, the For the People Act, is really important for us here in Michigan. And I think, as we all know, all swing states like Michigan are important for the rest of the country. Thank you, Christy. Thank you so much for doing that. And sorry for not telling everybody who you were. So you're the political <laughs> director for the Michigan chapter of Sierra Club. So sorry. Uh, yeah. And sorry to the folks at Sierra Club. Please, please don't get mad at me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the final person I wanted to introduce is Alex Galata, who is from Arizona, the Shunsan State, uh, and he's the Arizona State Director of All Voting is Local. So can you please tell us about uh, the very interesting uh, state that is uh, Arizona's in right now? All right. Well, it's a pleasure being here tonight. Uh, I think we probably all agree that like whatever our background is, our, our, our zip code, wherever we come from, you know, we want to pick our leaders and not have the, our leaders pick their voters. And we're going through a time where we're, we're really entering a really anti-democratic phase in our country. And you know, we want transparent processes that give people a voice. We have a handful of extremist politicians at the, nas at the national level and at the state level that are basically trying to silence voices. You know, we have had, we had in Arizona, as in many states, an extremely successful election the last cycle. And part of that was because in spite of COVID, so many people turned out. I mean, we, we minimize, we say that in spite of COVID bit, like this could have been a historically low election because of COVID in terms of turnout. But in spite of COVID, we turned out more people than ever. We turned out people of color in record numbers because people wanted to be heard. They didn't like the direction our country was going in. They wanted to be heard. And now we have these relentless attacks. There were 50 or more bills in Arizona all anti-voting bills, um, and you know, and they do. They all do the same things. They all sound the same. I was actually just on a colleague with a call who was talking about SB ninety, and he was showing me the language in Florida. It's identical to the language in Arizona, right? It's all being written by the same people. It's all being cut from the same playbook. It's restricting mail-in voting. So um, SB fourteen eighty five. It's a bill that basically purges people from our permanent early voting list in Arizona. Almost this last election, 88% of people voted by mail. So purging people from our early voting list or doing what Florida did, make people re-register every year to, or every other year to get your ballots in the mail, that impairs people's ability to participate. It cuts people out. It kicks people off. And even though it doesn't kick them off the rolls technically, it definitely limits their participation. And that's what it's designed to do. And so... SB 1485 in, in Arizona, that's that's what, what that bill does. There's another bill, SB 713, which required that that adds a bunch of identification requirements to um uh to, to early ballots, to mail-in ballots that require your social security number or the last four or your birthday, or there have been a variety of different variations on it. It hasn't passed yet, but they're gonna try and pass it. And if they can't pass it in the regular order, they're gonna try and stick it in the budget and pass it through that way. Um, you know, the For the People Act will address some of these things and it gets us, it basically creates, it basically helps create new minimum standards that we don't currently have. Right now, there's no baseline below which states can fall and hopefully we can move toward a place where at least we have that baseline. Then we can fight for other laws that actually make democracy better. Great, thank you, Alex. And so at this point, uh, well, first of all, thank you all for kind of laying it out. And we're gonna bring these speakers back in a little while in order to talk a little bit about the interaction between S1 and their states. But first, we're gonna bring Deshaun back to talk about our next speaker to go in a little bit deeper dive uh, of S1. So thank you all for your time and uh, you know, really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Deshaun? Thank you so much, Justin. And thank you to all the wonderful 
as the state speakers. And I think it really ties in together about how critical this fight is. And this is not something that's theoretical. This is happening right now, happening in Florida, happening in Arizona, happening in Michigan. We have Texas coming up. Uh, there's a bill in Ohio. These things are not isolated or not just cast off. And I think Alex said that he was just looking at a Florida bill. The language is exactly the same or mirrors it. And that's actually because the Heritage Foundation, a heavy leaning dark money conservative group, is actually pushing this out in all the states. And they're having barely any pushback. And I think that's where we, as environmentalists, you as people, as neighbors, that this is how we can fight back, and this is why it's critical. And I just wanted to add something. It just I just thought about it, but this reminds me of a quote by Mark Twain, which I may butcher, but it, it, he said, history rarely repeats itself, but it very often rhymes. And I think this is exactly what we're seeing. Um, but I just wanted to thank all the state speakers again. As Justin said, um, they'll be back for the Q&A segment. So if you have a question for them or just want to know more, definitely drop it in the chat. And um, we'll try our, we'll do our best to make sure that question is asked. But I want to thank all of you again, and also thank you, Justin um, Kwasa. I forgot to mention your last name, and I'm sure us Sierra Club, we're not, we're not mad at you. <laughs> um, but perfect. So now we're going to go to the next segment. Um, we're going to bring on Adam Leos uh, from Demos. Uh, for individuals who don't know what Demos is, it's actually a think tank that does incredible work. Um, about voting rights issues. And they do a lot of tremendous uh, info or um, educational events. So I definitely encourage you uh, to check them out. You can just quickly Google them. They have a lot of educational uh, documents that can really dive into what's going on in the States and what's going on nationally in the democracy realm. Um, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and bring Adam on. And then he also has a PowerPoint, which he's going to dive into um, what the For the People Act is, and then how it can also, um, if passed fully, how it can uh, negate some of these harmful uh, state bills that you just heard about. So Adam, I see you're on. I think we're going to go ahead and just give us a second to throw on the PowerPoint. Um, but perfect. There we go. Without, with that, uh, Adam, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, uh, Tishan, and for the little commercial for Demos. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Adam Liaz. I'm an attorney with Demos, and we're a public policy organization working on political equality, economic opportunity, and racial equity, and how they're all deeply linked together. And I'm really thrilled to be talking to uh, the environmental activist base. I got my start actually working on environmental issues as well, uh, uh, fighting the effects of urban sp uh, sprawling development. So I have uh, roots there and very excited to be talking to you, all of you about two main things. One is how the For the People Act can successfully push back on the right wing assault on voting rights we're seeing in the states right now. And then second, how it can actually help to build political power for black and brown, brown communities and create the more inclusive multiracial democracy that we need uh, overall. So next slide, please. So first, um, you know, uh, S1, the For the People Act can really effectively push back on some of these, uh, what you just heard about. And folks may be wondering, first of all, um, a lot of those, those are all pieces of state legislation and don't states control elections? Well, uh, actually the constitution does leave a lot to the states to uh, set up our elections, but there are a couple of important uh, exceptions. So if folks are familiar with the constitutional amendments that we have that prevent discrimination around voting based on race, sex, age, also our equal protection clause prevents uh, the dilution of someone's vote. But the other important exception is the elections clause in the constitution, which gives Congress broad authority over federal elections. And the For the People Act is an exercise in that authority. And what it sets out to do is exactly what Alex said, which is to set some minimum standards so that whether you are voting in a zip code in Arizona or in Texas or New York, that you have access to choose your president, uh, the Senate, and uh, your member of Congress, uh, just like everyone else, and sets those minimum standards that we can, as he said, then build upon. So uh, next slide, please. So as the folks have uh, been talking about, uh, we are facing broad attacks uh, in the states. Um, we, this actually, there was a, a label on top there, but we had, uh, there you go, 22 laws in 14 states uh, that have already been passed uh, with more to come, unfortunately, probably before le state legislatures wrap up uh, that have rolled back uh, voting rights uh, across the country. Uh, next slide, please. 
And many of these, and uh, I think there's a more, more graphics there. There you go, <laughs> another one, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, oh, uh, yep, uh, many of these, uh, sorry, I didn't realize that these had multiple images on them, uh, but many of these um, attacks are on vote by mail. So we had more than 60 million, 65 million people vote by mail in 2020, of course, because of COVID, uh, it really uh, shot up. Um, and uh, the number of people and the percentage of people uh, shot up, of course. And so because as, as folks uh, earlier said, that there's been a lot of success in building out vote by mail as a way for uh, easy uh, to make voting easier, we're now seeing the kinds of attacks uh, that have been described. So next slide, please. Here's just some examples of the kind of attacks that we're seeing on vote by mail. Uh, so as folks have mentioned, uh, you know, requiring ID or witness requirements to, to uh, send in your mail-in ballot, uh, eliminating that permanent absentee mail uh, list, and so making you sign up for mailing voting every single year instead of getting on a permanent list, um, restricting the way that you can return your ballot, so uh, rolling back drop boxes or other mechanisms, uh, preventing election officials from being proactive about getting absentee ballot applications out, and even preventing folks from uh, uh, putting return postage on the ballot. So those are just a range of things we're seeing on vote by mail. And next slide, please. Um, the For the People Act has a couple of key strategies to address this, and it's all based on, as Alex said, those minimum standards. And so there's a section in the act that provides for minimum standards. First, about how you get your ballot. So it actually requires states to send absentee ballot applications to all registered voters. It requires states to allow you to opt into a permanent mail voting list, and it prohibits IDs beyond signatures to obtain your mail ballot. So it makes it easier for you to get your ballot. And then it addresses how easy uh, or how many obstacles there are to returning the ballot. So it requires states to provide that return postage. It prohibits lots of extraneous requirements on casting your ballot. It requires an election day postmark deadline. This is really important because what we saw in a lot of states previously is that if the deadline is that your ballot has to arrive on election day, it's actually unclear when you need to send it by, and it could be up to the whims of how quickly the post office is moving. So this is a really important uh, piece to give people certainty that if they get their ballot in the mail by election day, it will be timely and count. Um, and then it requires uh, opportunities like drop boxes and other to return your ballot and also requires states to allow what's known as community ballot collection so that organizations and others can help folks in the community get those ballots back. Next slide, please. Um, and it also protects uh, from other attacks beyond vote by mail. So more than 20 states have started to move towards stricter voter ID provisions. This, uh, the For the People Act would require a signature affirmation to be sufficient to, uh, to be able to actually vote. Uh, you can see many states have rolled back early voting. Uh, the For the People Act would require a minimum of two weeks of that. And then lots of states are moving to expand voter purges, which is removing folks who are already on the rolls. Uh, the For the People Act contains protections there. And many folks may have followed the drama in Texas uh, over the last couple of weeks where uh, that state legislature put forth kind of a toxic stew of a lot of these anti-voter uh, provisions. And you can see them listed out. And the For the People Act would prevent many of those and most of those uh, voter rollbacks. And for that reason, the legislators in Texas who had the courage to walk out and prevent that from going through in Texas have been pleading with the Congress to pass the For the People Act to protect uh, voters in Texas. Next slide, please. So going beyond uh, these protections, the For the People Act actually also contains a lot of affirmative provisions that can help us create the uh, structural uh, inclusive democracy that we need and to fight back the structural racism that's been baked into our democracy since our founding. And so next slide, please. Um, so automatic voter registration, I think the titles are going to come in after probably, there you go. Uh, automatic voter registration uh, would disproportionately help more people of color to get on the rolls. This is a really simple concept where the government already knows a lot of information about you because you've interacted with them through the DMV or other areas. So let's flip the burden, make it the burden of the government to get you on the registration rolls. And that can help a lot of folks get on the rolls, including a lot of black and brown folks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, same day election registration um, also can help uh, many people uh, register and vote on the same day, either in the early voting period uh, or in uh, the on election day. 
I mean, there's a graphic. Uh, you can see that turnout is increased during same day voter registration. Uh, I think there's another graphic uh, <laughs> under there uh, that shows increases in, in um, turnout uh, with voter uh, same day voter registration. Next slide, please. Um, I already mentioned that uh, the uh, For the People Act would eliminate discriminatory voter ID provisions, which have a disproportionate impact on black and brown voters. Next, please. Uh, it would also uh, restore the voting rights of nearly 2 million Black and Latinx folks, uh, folks who have been convicted of a felony but are no, lo no longer serving uh, a sentence uh, and right now are uh, disenfranchised across uh, many states. Uh, the For the People Act would address that uh, racist problem. Next. Uh, it would uh, address the problem of partisan gerrymandering by independent redistricting commissions. Keep going, please. And it would also address the problem of big money in politics, which is a racial equity problem. And as our first speaker mentioned, a big source of our environmental problems because of big money uh, polluter money. Uh, so uh, a recent study showed that more than 90% of the money that was been reported in a recent three decade period came from wealthy white donors. Um, and the uh, For the People Act contains a few provisions that would help balance out our democracy and open up the process uh, for uh, lots of folks to get involved in the process and help decide who runs uh, for office in the first place and who wins elections and make sure that the size of our wallet does not uh, determine the strength of our voice in our democracy, which is so important both for racial equity and for environmental progress. Um, we can move forward. Uh, we can skip through uh, these other slides. I'll just close by saying that, um, you know, the, the key thing here is that uh, this is a piece of legislation that has many parts of it that are important individually and can very successfully push back on many of the anti-voter attacks that our speakers just talked about. But the key thing also is that together as a package, it is transformative. So it's really important that the protections on voting rights, uh, the protections against big money in politics, the protections against politicians choosing their voters through partisan gerrymandering all come together in a package that can is greater than the sum of its parts and can actually transform our democracy into the truly inclusive multiracial democracy that we've aspired to be, but as of yet have never really achieved. I'll close there. So Tishan, turn it back to you. Perfect, thank you so much, Adam. And let's all take a pause. I know we just threw a ton at you, um, but I think Adam, what you said that this bill we need all the parts together. That the greater that the um, it, that the components um, are greater than the entire sum. That each part plays off one another and must be passed together. Um, really appreciate it, Adam. And then I also wanted to flag for everyone listening: if you have questions about that, uh, about what Adam said, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, we we'll definitely love to try and get you those answers. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and go to the next uh, segment. So this is the Q&A segment. So we're going to bring on Joe uh, from EDF Action. And Joe's going to moderate uh, the Q&A segment. And we're also going to bring on all our speakers as well. Unfortunately, Jaleesa had to leave us, so she won't be on. But if you do have questions for her, definitely still drop it in the chat. And then we'll try and get you those answers. Um, but with that, Joe, if you want to go ahead and just introduce yourself, I think we're still going to throw a couple more people on. And then if you want to take it away, that'll be wonderful. Thanks, Tishan. Hey, everybody. Uh, Joe Bonfilio, I uh, head EDF Action. Um, first, thank you for everybody that has joined uh, from the EDF Action family and, uh, and our allies uh, across the country. Thank you for what you do for our organizations and what you will do to help us in this fight. Um, I just got done voting. Uh, I'm joining you from Virginia. Uh, this is our, our primary day uh, uh, in Virginia. So I, uh, I left, I voted a uh, full slate of candidates to come in and, and join this, this awesome panel. So we're gonna get right after it uh, and ask you zero questions about Virginia uh, and um, far more questions about um, what's happening in and around uh, this country uh, that is incredibly concerning and really should have our activists and our members uh, really thinking about the intersection of voting rights and, uh, and, and, and climate and environmental progress. So let's start, um, Adam, with you. Uh, yes, there was a lot to, to dig through, 
but in the process, we were actually getting questions on Facebook and, and YouTube uh, that were aiming um, uh, really at what can be done uh, about voter suppression. And I'm going to sort of start with you and maybe ask you to sort of dig in a little bit of, uh, of what the, the voting rights bills could do uh, if they were passed uh, to help uh, um, put, to help, to help stamp out some of the voter suppression that we're seeing. Sure. And um, I think it's probably useful to distinguish and talk about two really important voting rights bills that are uh, on the table right now in Congress. So one is the For the People Act, which we've been discussing. Um, and I went through some, you know, some of its provisions and we can talk a little bit more that, about that. Um, the other one is the Voting Rights Advancement Act, which is the uh, bill that would fix the terrible 2013 Supreme Court decision, which took the gutted the heart out of the uh, one of the most important provisions of the Voting Rights Act, um, which is you know are the crown jewel of the civil rights movement and the most important uh, voting rights legislation in our history. So just to to give a couple of points about you know what each of those would do. So the the voting what the what the Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act, which is the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, importantly, um, although John Lewis uh, also basically wrote most of the voting protections in the For the People Act. So both of these have John Lewis's legacy deeply embedded in them. Um, and we should be proud to carry forward that amazing legacy. Uh, the Voting Rights Act, what that would do is it would restore um, what's known as preclearance. Um, so basically, one of the tough things about voter suppression is that states and localities can be very creative about it. So you pass one set of protections and then they figure out another way to get around um, and do something else that's devious. So the solution that folks came up with back in the 1960s, which was brilliant, was to say, you know what? We're not gonna try to predict right now every single thing that you might do in the future. What we're gonna say is that if you have a history of discriminating against mostly black voters, then we are going to require you to actually get pre-approval before you make changes to your voting laws so that we can be sure that you're not up to anything nefarious. And this proved to be the most effective intervention probably that we've ever seen on the voting rights front. And it really took care of a lot of the nefarious schemes that uh, folks that the, uh, the folks were trying to uh, enact. And so what this, the Voting Rights Advancement Act would do would be to restore that by uh, technically re restoring the formula that decides which states and localities are covered by what's known as that preclearance provision. So it's absolutely essential that we do that. It's a really powerful uh, tool but it's a limited tool in a few important ways. Number one is that it is all about racial discrimination in voting and you have to have, you know, sort of prove that it is gonna have a discriminatory impact against black and brown voters. If you just roll back voting rights for everybody in a way that makes voting harder for young people or for everyone across the board, you might not be able to show that it has a disproportionate impact and that will fall outside of the uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, coverage. Um, it's also, in some ways, for parts of it, the core parts of it will be limited in geography. So there are only nine states that were fully covered by that uh, act uh, back when it was, before it was gutted in Shelby. And so, of course, as we just heard in this call, we have problems across the country that we need to address. Um, it also, by the way, um, would not address uh, things that have already happened, right? So right now, these four, 22 laws in 14 states, they're already through and the you know, preclearance is a, is a preventative in the future. It's not gonna help us with those. So, so it's a very, very important um, and we need to pass it and we need to complement it with the For the People Act, which has this robust set of protections that really take a totally different strategy. And it's a strategy Alex talked about, which is providing minimum standards floors across the country. So whether you live in a state that is historically discriminated against black and brown folks, or you live in a state that is almost entirely white and so doesn't, doesn't, hasn't, doesn't have that history, but still there are politicians who are trying to choose their voters and, um, and have bad incentives, that the basic uh, ground floor protections will reach you no matter where you are in the country. Thanks, Adam. Chris, I'm going to come to you. This, this, this fight has become so incredibly partisan. And your state, especially in Michigan, is, is seeing all kinds of shenanigans, I think is actually the technical term, of the legislature trying to circumvent the governor to, uh, to enact more voting restrictions. Can you give us a sense of how successful you think some of that could be uh, in, in your state? What are you sort of seeing uh, as uh, the future of voting Michigan plays out? Um, I mean, I think the, the future is really unclear right now. Um, unfortunately, our constitution has such an obscure provision in it um, that's going to allow for an extreme minority of voters, only 340,000 voters, to override the will 
of the you know millions of voters that were in support of expanding voting rights in Michigan in 2018. Um, so the the likely outcome is that the petitions will be circulated, the signatures will be gathered, and it's going to wind up in court. And there's going to be you know a succession of court battles over whether or not this legislation is going to become law or not, and how that interacts with our constitution. It's it's tricky. It's going to be a big mess. Um, in the interim. I think that it's going to be used to fire up the opposition um, and it's going to fire up our base too, quite frankly. Uh, voting is really embraced broadly in Michigan and we see that in polling. We've seen it when you actually take questions directly to citizens. Um, a likely outcome is that this may have to, the rollback and restrictions might have to go to the entire state and be voted on. Um, on a, ball a statewide ballot instead of just going through the legislature, uh, that would probably be a good outcome, um, but it's unclear right now. And I think that it it calls for the kind of swift federal action that we need to get that baseline of democracy so that citizens across the country, no matter what the partisan rhetoric, um, the, the height of the partisan rhetoric in your state, whatever is going on with it, it's not undercut um, or you have that backstop of the federal government guaranteeing a baseline as folks have talked about, uh, because it is, it's unclear exactly what it's gonna look like. Uh, but it's also clear that the opposition is very well organized, uh, very well funded, and they are doubling down on everything that we saw in 2020. They're definitely not fading into the background. Thank you. Alex, I'm gonna come to you on this one. I'm gonna stick with the partisanship question uh, or, or sort of problem that we're seeing and flip it a little bit. We saw uh, this week where Joe Manchin, Senator from uh, West Virginia, uh, I'm seeing the smile, I'm seeing the, net, the, the, the head nodding across the panel, so we may, we may, we may, we may stay here. Um, but I'll, sort of, I'll, I'll set it up for, for our, uh, our, our watchers. Um, uh, Man Senator Manchin said that um, he is opposing moving uh, the, I believe it was S1 um, uh, at this time, because it, it had not garnered bipartisan support in the Senate, uh, and that there was not, uh, in, in his view, a, a path to 60. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing a not bet here. He did not, of course, say that there's anything wrong with S1. What was your takeaway uh, uh, of, of that and sort of this moment that we're in where partisan politics is absolutely coloring what can get done uh, on this issue that's gonna affect so many people? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a tricky one. Like I would not focus on him. Uh, I think that's why he want that's what he wants us to do is focus on him. Uh, he's made himself the center. Um, I mean, there. I, so in your earlier question, you asked about the partisanship, and in some ways, like I don't see it quite that way. It's about people who believe in truth and facts and data and people who've given that up. It's about people who believe in science and people who've abdicated a belief in science. And, you know, it's a perpetuation of the big lie. It's a perpetuation of conspiracy theories and lies that are not based in fact and data that are being used to drive policy in this very twisted and unhealthy way. And there are a lot of people on both sides of of the aisle that know that that's a bad thing, but a lot of the people on one side of the aisle are afraid to say it. They're afraid of the way that their party has been taken over by a fringe minority and and, and they can't find a way out and we can help them find a way out, right? There are a lot of business, businesses need to speak out. Other people need to speak out. We need to empower the moderate voices in the middle to say, this is, we want to believe in a democracy where every vote is counted, where every voice is, is heard and where we win on the playing field of ideas and not this pure power, we're going to steal this election sort of point of view. And so, uh, you know, I, th I think we I think we're gonna have to fight in Congress to get this bill passed but just Senator Manchin or Senator Manchin is like just the beginning of a process that says we need to overcome we need to get we're not going to probably overcome the filibuster with Republicans but we can get some Republicans possibly to cross over we need to be working on that and then we need to get cinema and Manchin to basically back down on this filibuster protection uh, and we need to keep pressuring them on that but it really has to be this focus about truth and data versus 
lies and conspiracy theories, and we need to keep pounding that home. This is just a continuation of the insurrection. This is just a continuation of the big lie, and it's just being done now in our state houses. We need to figure out a way to fight back. I'm going to stay right there. Uh, Dolores on Facebook asks, what can any of us individuals do uh, in, in this moment in time? And, and Alex, you were you, you were right there. I'm going to I'm going to come right back to you and, and ask Christy to, to join in with this as well, uh, because your, your perspectives here and helping guide what people can do right now, I, I think is super important. Well, I'll finish just. Act, activate, right? Get Contact your legislators. Tell them you want policy that's based on facts and data. You want to know the basis for the legislation they're pushing. And if it's that there are bamboo fibers on the, on the, on the ballots, making a reference to the, to the sham election review that's going on in Arizona, you shouldn't support that. Um, holding public officials accountable, like the Senate of the, the, the president of the Arizona Senate is getting away wasting taxpayer dollars on that. There should be consequences for that. Businesses and other people should be standing up against that, and people have the power to make that happen. You calling, you calling the governor, you telling the governor to intervene. Um, you have power, we have power, but we need to activate. And But part of it is like, you know, for a while we had an enemy that was, that was you know, in a person that people focused on, and now we have an that enemy is broken into a thousand different cancers and we need to like fight them all. And the only way to do that is we don't have that focus, but we need to be as activated. We need to even be more activated. And so that would be my, my recommendation. Take action, call your, call your legislators, make sure your state people understand where you're at and hold them accountable. Get businesses that you know to take stands, get them to stand up and speak out. Christy. Uh, yeah, same advice. Um, you know, our, our state legislators don't hear from constituents nearly as much as our congressional representatives. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you uh, get 10 people together to an in-district meeting with your state representative or state senator, depending on what your state government looks like, um, that makes a big impact. Uh, so right now, Sierra Club is calling into state house and state senate election committee members, um, and we are getting hundreds of phone calls in, and that's meaningful. That has a huge impact, and we can leverage that kind of support across the country in all of these states. Um, the only other thing I'll mention is uh, state legislatures. Yes, that's primarily my focus, but. Uh, during recess, when elected officials are back in district, they absolutely have to be able to say that this is the biggest mandate that they must get done when they go back in the fall. So this August, take over their offices until you have 100% assurance that they are going to be supporting the For the People Act. And even if they're friendly and you know they are, it still helps if they can go back to Congress and say, I have people banging down my door making sure that I guarantee that this is gonna happen. So make sure you make a congressional visit in August and make sure you have your state legislators. They don't hear from many people and they're probably gonna be scared of you when you show up. Love both those responses. Adam, coming back to you on this one uh, from Mark and Barbara on the, on, on the YouTubes, uh, asking out, outside of the passage of these bills, uh, which we'll, we'll close with, uh, there, are, there are efforts underway uh, in the courts to stop some of the things that we've been talking about today. Can you give the, 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 those attendings the sense of uh, next steps there, how they're moving, uh, and, and what, the, what, what, what the potential is for, for those, uh, those court actions to at least stop some of the worst abuses that we're seeing in states? Sure. So um, it's a great question. In fact, uh, I, I was happy to see Jalisa earlier because at Dem Demos, we're actually suing Florida for uh, their rollbacks. Um, and, you know, l l let's be clear, the Trump administration succeeded in packing the federal, federal judiciary, um, you know, in seriously, especially at the circuit court level. So there's a difficult landscape uh, in the courts for a lot of these uh, lawsuits. But nonetheless, uh, some of these uh, policies that are being passed are so egregious that we can use the tools. There's really two main tools that we can use. One is the Voting Rights Act, which we've been talking about earlier. So there was one part of that that was gutted, which was the pre-clearance part, but there's another part that remains uh, alive and, and it is actually being threatened in the Supreme Court right now. But for now we have a path, which is what's called section two, which is allows us to prove that these um, 
these policies have a disparate impact on people of color. So there are avenues through Section 5. There's also uh, a First and 14th Amendment claim that you can bring uh, that basically says that doesn't require specifically racial discrimination and basically says that this is a an unacceptable burden on your right to vote. And so attorneys are using both of those tools uh, at, you know, at our disposal to push back on a lot of these uh, these um, uh, problematic state laws. And I think what you'll expect, what you'll see is you'll see um, some of the most egregious uh, of these laws be successfully challenged. But because of the challenging landscape in the courts, you're not going to see all of them taken down by the courts, which is why we need federal action. We cannot let action in the courts be an excuse to not move forward with the For the People Act and these federal laws, because we're not going to catch it all in the courts. That is absolutely just not on the table right now. And that's why Congress has to act. And the president has to get as engaged as possible and push Congress to actually push it through while he's doing great things on the court. The president just, uh, you know, the, the, well, there was a there was an announcement in the uh, papers that there may be some voting rights attorneys going on to the courts uh, that Senator Schumer is pushing, which would be great. The president should follow through on that. And the president needs to focus on these legislative fixes as well. Such an important point. Thank you, panel. Uh, Christy, Alex, Adam, uh, for, for, for joining us. Thank you for all the members and, and, and activists that joined asking these questions. Tishan, I'm going to uh, hand the, the baton back to you. Uh, take us home. Thank you so much, Joe. And yeah, thank you to all the speakers. Adam, I think you hit it perfectly, where yes, we can challenge some things in courts, but that is not the end all. There will still be provisions that are still implemented. And that's why, as Alex and Christy mentioned, that is when you, where each and every one of you can take action. And I know sometimes you hear it all the time, and I'll be honest, sometimes even I'm annoyed, but making that phone call, going to that door, going to that your state senator, um, sending even an email, those things really matter. Um, in this next panel that we're going to bring on, we're going to talk about uh, skills, so different things you can actually do uh, to really make a difference. And I think it's now critical that we make that difference. So I want to thank everybody, Adam, Alex, Christy, thank you so much for uh, taking time. Joe, thank you again for moderating. Really appreciate you all. We're going to go ahead and pause for a second as you bring on our next uh, speakers. And they're going to dive into exactly how you can take action and what does that look like. So that will give you a little bit um, as a basis to kind of uh, help guide you over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we're joined by the tremendous Sam and Full Lobby. I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves. And then we're also going to bring up a PowerPoint uh, so then you can see the ways you can get involved and also provide potential talking points. So when you go to the offices, when you're on the phone, when you're sending an email, you will have a little bit of guidance to help you really hammer home that message. And just before I pass it off, and I'm sure Sam and Falabi are going to speak upon it, but we really encourage you to personalize those messages. Making it personal really helps staffers, helps senators understand what you're going through and understand the constituents. Uh, so with that, Sam, I'll hand it off to you. And I do believe we're also going to bring on uh, the PowerPoint as well. Thank you so much, Tashan. Um, I'm Sam Lockhart. I work at the National Wildlife Federation. Um, I'll let Falabi introduce himself to you. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Folabi Olagbaju. I'm the Democracy Campaign Director for Greenpeace. Well, I'm so excited for Falabi and I to get to do this uh, presentation together. The National Wildlife Federation and Greenpeace really don't work together that often, but I think this uh, really demonstrates how our movement um, is really united across the conservation and environmental spectrum uh, around the need for us to protect our democracy. Um, we know that everyone across the country cares about clean air and clean water. And the reason why we have to fight so hard is because our power and our votes um, have been uh, you know, minimized by these attempts to uh, suppress the vote um, and through gerrymandering and some of the other things that we talked about. So we are really united across the environmental movement about the need to uh, see the For the People Act move forward. Um, I'm gonna talk for the next couple of minutes first about um, purpose and impact, why we, we do this, why we contact senators. I'll share a few talking points. You have heard so much more information, but I'm just gonna go over a few quick things as mostly a reminder of everything you, you heard over the last hour um, of what's in the For the People Act. And then I'll hand it off to Falabi to share more about ways you can get engaged and take action. Um, next slide. Okay, so why are we asking you to do this? Phone calls, emails, 
I'll add social media here. These things really work. Um, we, we've heard this talked about already, but we are in constant um, communication and meeting with meetings with uh, senators and their staff in efforts to get S1 for the People Act over the finish line. And they are keeping track. They are keeping score on how many folks are calling, how many folks are sending in email messages or individualized messages on this topic. And they are hearing loud and clear, unfortunately, from our opposition. Um, so this is really why we need to make sure that they're hearing from constituents that they need to not only vote the right way, but fight as hard as they can over the next few weeks and months to make sure that For the People Act passes in the Senate. Um, we also talked about this a little bit, but you need to call your senators, even if they already support the bill. Um, I know a lot of folks are on here from California and, <laughs> um, and places that are probably like, my senator's already totally on board. What, what good is it going to do to call? So a couple things. One is, as I said, they're hearing from opposition. They need, they need to be able to say, my constituents are knocking down my door trying to make this happen. Um, the other piece is that in order to convince the few holdouts that are left um, to really get over the finish line, we need to put as much political pressure on these folks as possible. We do that in a lot of ways, but one way is making sure that all of their colleagues in the Senate are knocking on their office door and saying, my constituents are telling me that they need us to get this done, um, and we need to make sure we get it over the finish line. So um, folks like Joe Manchin need to be hearing from every single one of his Democratic colleagues. And I'll say for those of you um, in states like Texas, I heard folks on the chat were saying, what if I do, what if I'm in Texas? I'll say same, I, this was said, obviously there's a lot happening at the state level, definitely get involved at the state level. Um, that's where your voice is gonna have a huge impact, especially where we're seeing so much happening there. But even there, again, make it as uncomfortable and, and upsetting as possible for someone to vote against this. Folks who are voting against th these democracy reforms, um, they should be embarrassed, they should be sweating it um, because they're really gonna be seen by history as, as being on the wrong side of history after this moment. So, and they need to know that and hear from, from everyone. Okay, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna, again, this is a super quick overview um, of uh, stuff you've already mostly heard tonight, but there are four main components really intertwined within the For the People Act. Um, the first has to do with voting rights and methods. And we went through a lot of details on all the ways we make voting more accessible um, for folks so that they have access to the vote. This is our right um, at, and as citizens, so they should have access. Um, the second piece is campaign finance reform. I think we all know um, in the environmental world, we are up against really big money. Um, and it is why we, we have to fight so hard on things that we all agree on, like clean air and clean water. So we need to see campaign finance reform um, to, in order to really win on a lot of our issues in particular. Strengthening of anti-corruption provisions. I don't know who's pro-corruption out there. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, and then banning partisan gerrymandering. This was talked about as well. We need to make sure that every congressional district really represents the people. Um, and the way they're being drawn right now just is, is really not, not that. And we all know that. So um, a lot of folks remember last year you were asked to fill out the census. You Somebody knocked on your door. You filled it out. Um, this year, just in, in a couple of months, we're going to get the full data set from that census. And that is going to inform redrawing all of the congressional district maps across the country. So so we need to make sure that we're banning partisan gerrymandering before all of um, that those districts are being redrawn. So that's why it's this urgency of this moment in time right now to get this bill over the finish line. Um, and it, you know, census is only once every 10 years, so it could really set us back for a long time. Um, and finally, this was talked about as well. I know in that Joe Manchin op-ed, he talked about, oh, this bill needs bipartisan support. Well, guess what? Good news, Joe Manchin. It does have bipartisan support. <laughs> um, recent polls showed that 83% of Americans support this bill. And when you talk about the specific provisions in this bill, 73% of independents and 74% of Republicans also support this bill. This is popular across the aisle. This is popular with Republicans and Democrats. The only place this isn't popular is uh, um, with some people on Capitol Hill. Um, that is the only place where it's partisan, but everywhere else across the country, this is a bipartisan issue and, and we should own that. 
Um, and finally, this was really the bulk of our talk today about all of the attacks happening in state legislatures across the country it really increases the urgency and need to standardize the freedom to vote for all Americans. Um, and in particular, uh, you know, we talked about the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is another great way to protect our voting rights. Um, but for the People Act in particular, we'll address some of those attacks that have already happened and already been signed into the law at state level rather than simply um, create new policy moving forward. So um, that is incredibly important. So those are my quick talking points and I'm gonna hand it over to Falabi to talk about what you can do and how you can take action. Thank you, Sam. Uh, Greenpeace is definitely happy uh, just up to be working with the uh, National Wildlife Federation on this uh, issue. Uh, I'm just gonna go quickly go over things that I've been talked about uh, kind of underscore and uh, and really emphasize them. Nothing that I'm going to say here is going to be really shocking to you. Uh, definitely, email your senators. You know, let them know that our democracy is at a tipping point. Um, let her or him know that uh, you want them to support S1, and you want them to really pass pass the legislation by any means necessary. Um, definitely, personalize your email. It's always important, even when you have a form email or uh, talking points. Personalizing it. Uh, really carries a lot of weight with, with the senators. Uh, again, call your senator, uh, let them know, know that time, now is the time to act and that uh, you know, our planet and our democracy is at stake. There's so much at stake that we can't afford not to pass S1 right now. Uh, make sure you amplify your tweets and posts. Uh, I, I always tweet, uh, tweet at my senators at the, at, all the time. Make sure you tag your senators uh, in your tweet, retweeting is always very important and uh, make sure that uh, it helps us to really amplify our messages. Uh, the fourth thing you to do is to uh, send personalized letter. Um, again, writing letters to your district offices is very, very important. It's a way to build relationship uh, with your local offices, particularly now in, during the COVID time, they are very more important. They are gotten a really heightened level of importance. And, it's always very easy and convenient for you to uh, reach out to your senators in their district rather than coming to DC. And they get the letters, you can get letters, uh, handwritten letters in the, in, the, in the district offices. It's more difficult to get them to the DC offices. Uh, make sure that you are participating in the uh, virtual, uh, the, the, uh, the um, Declaration for American uh, Democracy virtual lobby day is happening. Make sure that you are participating in it. Uh, and you can also sign up for this uh, in their website and you can also get uh, more information on, on that. Uh, the last thing we'll say again is make sure that you're writing a letter to the editor. Uh, the For the People Act is very uh, much in the news today. Uh, there's no week, no day that people are not talking about it. That's an opportunity for you uh, to really uh, uh, send a letter to your editor. You, know, uh, you put your personal stories and make sure that you have a local angle uh, into the letter. That really helps get the attention of your senators. Uh, we can do this, folks. Uh, let's, get, let's get to it. Thank you. And I'm, now I'm going to pass it on to Tishan. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think both of you hit it up perfectly. Right like now is the time to act that we have to do something. Schumer already said that he's gonna put this bill up for a vote in two weeks, uh, June 21st. So we're gonna have, um, we're gonna understand if we can actually pass this bill on that, on that week. So even doing that little thing, sending an email, writing a handwritten personalized letter uh, to your district office, making that phone call, those things are critical and can get this over the finish line. And I'll be honest again, I know I sometimes don't like it. So I know a couple of you out there may not like it as well, but taking that one minute, that really can get this over the finish line. And as Adam Leo has said before, this is happening all over the country, that these attacks are not isolated. And passing the For the People Act will standardize voting rights and and implement a whole bunch of reforms that we truly need uh, to help move our country forward. Uh, so with that, I know we're a bit over the time limit, so I appreciate everyone st uh, hopping or staying on, but we're gonna go ahead and bring everyone back in just to say goodbye. Um, also really wanted to thank uh, Jennifer McCarran, Hannah Black, Courtney Height, 
Hillary Larson, um, who are all working the back screens. They're tremendous. I don't know how y'all do it, but I really do appreciate you guys um, hanging on. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and wave goodbye and just w want to thank everyone so much.